The Giant Killers by Conway Fitzgerald Chapter 4 It was in the stifling heat of the late summer sun when the white flame was sent on their first mission, deep into the far west, along the vast, untamed borderlands. Their mission was to determine the size and intensity of the growing orc and hominoid coalition. The Order hoped to weed it out before it gained confidence and then grew completely out of control. The White Flame's mission was to determine the source of the Orc's leadership, their numbers, and logistical methods, and to assess the threat they may yet pose to the many farming villages of Ebuck, Teton, and Bishop's Gate. Fergos, the newly appointed leader, had handpicked the seven young members of the White Flame personally. His oldest friend, the sword bearer Theos, was his first choice. The two old friends from Ebuck had succeeded on every mission that was ordered of them. Fergos had unlimited confidence in Theos. He was a very efficient thinker and a keenly insightful planner. Never satisfied with his own knowledge, he always sought out greater challenges to his mind. In so doing, he had befriended an eastern mage named Khan, who had traveled to Voss in search of new and greater knowledge of magic. Both Fergos and Theos took a liking to Khan and convinced him to remain out west and join them. Khan, impressed by Fergos' goodness, and Theos' intelligence agreed. Khan convinced Theos that he should learn the ways of magic, and his study began in earnest. Theos excelled quickly, merging the mastery of the two great disciplines, magic and steel. Though as Theos devoted himself to his arcane studies, he had been replaced as Fergos' shield man by two superb young paladins by the name of Reggie of Ebuck and Kiantan of Tull. They were fearless and noble fighting men, completely dedicated to Fergos and his teachings. Kiantan was huge, considered by many to be the strongest man in the known world. Than was a ranger apprentice to the ranger lord, Rhys an esteemed member of the Order. Than was quite skilled and extremely dedicated. He also had been chosen by Fergos to be a member of the newly reignited White Flame. Lastly, Fergos invited Dan Tenuviel of Alinor. Dan had come to rely on Fergus's uplifting spirit, and he trusted Fergus like a father. Dan was honored to join Fergos as a full-fledged member and under his leadership. Than's mentor, Rhys, traveled alongside the White Flame on their first mission to supervise the young sect. Rhys was a very experienced ranger and came along to assist the young group, to help them with their analysis and determine proper tactics and procedures. They weren't quite ready to be completely on their own. Rhys always made it a point to illustrate the importance of utilizing the three arts as one, steel, magic, and prayer. He taught them how to work together as a group and fuse the three arts into the discipline of one burning flame, joined of light and power, as was the credo of their order. They had encountered many tribes of well-equipped and well-organized orcs and other violent hominoids in the northern borderlands. Contrary to expectation, the further south and west that they ventured, the fewer tribes of orcs and other humanoids they encountered. The greatest concentration of hostiles tended to be in the northern hills, whereas to the south, the fertile Sharmal River Valley 
seemed largely unthreatened. Some scouting missions had ventured to Bishop's Gate and the Sharmel River Valley to confirm this, but strangely, none had yet returned. The White Flames camp was presently positioned within a row of barren, windswept hills about 50 miles southwest of Bishop. It was as close to that city and Dan's homeland of Alinor as he had been in many years. The closer the group came to it, the greater the temptation was to see for himself what had come of his former homeland. Despite Fergus's teachings on the virtues of truthful openness with his companions and Reese's intense training on teamwork, Dan felt a sudden, irresistible compulsion for independent action. Unlike before when he was forced to leave these lands, now he was no longer a boy, but a grown man. He was fully armed and armored with the highest grade steel, and now well versed in the arts of proper swordsmanship. With each mile closer they ventured to that place, Dan suffered ever more intensely within a silent cognitive dissonance. He loved and respected his new family, but still dreamt of the family he had lost and his mother's indelible call for vengeance. As the group gathered by the fire that evening, Dan wondered how much longer he might have to wait before having this kind of opportunity again, to be this close. He awoke the next morning before dawn, compelled to act. The fire was nearly out, so the rangers, always alerted, figured Dan was gathering more kindling, but instead, Dan risked his life and his place in the order, leaving the group behind without saying a word. He rode off into the sunrise, across the grassy plains to the southeast, towards the fertile Sharmel River Valley. However, when he reached some of the outer farming villages later that day, they were far from fertile. The fields, which should have been filled with crops for fall harvest, were now totally fallow. The ground itself seemed dead, diseased. The few villagers he encountered along that road were motionless, consumed in sorrow. Dan tried to find out what happened. You there, woman. Why are all these fields so fallow? He asked of a miserable looking peasant who sat helpless and grief stricken on the side of the dusty road. Why? Why? Nothing will grow here. Everything has the sickness, for we are unworthy. We are all doomed. Soon the sickness will find us, and it will find you as well. No one is safe, she said, pointing at him with no more tears left to cry. What is this sickness you speak of? Dan asked. The peasant woman looked at him, puzzled by his ignorance. The ground wilts all our plantings with cankers and mold. <laughs> all our people got the blood cough and then they died. Moscow is angry. We are all unworthy. Soon we will join them and our bodies will be taken to him by the collectors. <laughs> Dan continued from one small farming village to the next and found the same situation, or worse. These villagers were all getting infected with a strange sickness. They were all without food stocks. The decaying dead were everywhere. The living starved 
while they awaited the further suffering caused by the strange deadly disease. The sight of the infected people was gruesome to behold, and the smell was worse. A chorus of buzzing flies filled the rank air as Dan approached another small village on the barren road south. There he encountered three men working alongside the road beside a horse-drawn cart. They wore masks on their faces, presumably to protect against the sickness. Some were loading the corpses of the dead onto the cart, while others burned the clothes and homes of the infected. You men, where are you taking those bodies? The masked men look back to Dan. You must be a stranger to these lads. One asked ominously. Dan thought of how much his father's domain had now changed. Not a stranger to the land, but I have been away for some time. We are the collectors. Another voice offered. We bring the dead as offerings to Moscow to show our willingness. Dead bodies as offerings? Why would you be willing to do that? You have been away, but you will learn soon, young knight. You too will see. Your gods have no power here. Only Moscow offers us an end to true pain. Another said. Before Dan could get clarification, he noticed a team of armed horsemen approaching his position from the road south. There were about ten of them. They were coming fast. Now you've done it. Don't be a fool. Submit now, while you still can. The masked man said as he hurled another stiffened infant's corpse onto his overloaded cart. Dan did not flee the men as they surrounded him. The collectors moved their cart away in fear. Who are you that you come to this village on a healthy horse, disturbing the collectors? One of the men-at-arms called out. I am a traveler from the north. Come to see why my friends had not yet returned from their journey here. What friends be those? The man asked sizing up Dan's expensive horse and gear. The armed gang was not in uniform. Their gear consisted of many different styles of dress and armor. They were all humans, but their faces told of obvious differences in their geographic origins. Huh? What's that? Dan did not answer them. Both Dan and his warhorse were very still. Both seemed unfazed by the horrors before them. It was then, Dan noticed, that amidst this motley posse was another wooden cart being dragged behind them. This cart contained a man that was still living. His hands, neck, and mouth were bound by leather straps attached to ropes and chain links secured to the posts. Like a spider's web, it was interconnected and designed to give and flex a bit, so the prisoner could move and tire himself out as he struggled to break free. The broken man's eyes met Dan's. His hopeless stare told of the futility of his own resistance. This captive was likely being kept alive for blood sacrifice at Mosgal's temple. Perhaps they have submitted to the master. They are either one with him now, <laughs> or they are dead. There is no third choice. Dan noticed one of the men circling him was wearing an insignia of the order. He had his horse step closer. Dan recognized him. He was once part of his own initiate class. He had been missing for over a year. Tarnan? Dan asked. The man did not respond. Rather than meet Dan with his clouded gaze, Tarnan seemed content to look beyond him. The other riders closed the space between themselves and Dan. Just then, another rider approached. It was a Moscow cleric. He dismounted and approached Dan confidently. Ah, ha, ha, ha. 
Yes, he has come. Another has come to be freed. The boisterous priest proclaimed. He made his way through the riders that had encircled Dan. You have come seeking freedom from judgment and salvation from pain. How do you know what I seek? Dan asked the cleric. The Moscow priest was young and animated. He wore paint on his face to make his heavily accented facial gestures seem even more surreal. Because you're here. Why else? You've come to sit at the feet of the master and be freed from all guilt, freed from fearing the judgment of small men. Only one judge matters. Only he can make you free. You must be thinking of somebody else. Dan responded smugly. Free to pursue vengeance? The cleric said as his white eyes lit up. Free to be the hand that brings justice to those most deserving of death. The priest had gotten Dan's attention. He stared at the priest while the circle of horses tightened around him. Ah, yes. The young cleric smiled. That is why you're here. You will find it with Moscow, young knight. Submit, for it is he who can grant all your desires. He said ominously over the constant hum of buzzing flies. Now that he had formally demanded Dan's submission, the horsemen closed in further, and Dan prepared for his attack. He looked down at the cleric like he was contemplating the true meaning of his words. But he was really looking past him in periphery to see how many of the others he would have to drop in order to breach this encirclement, after he had killed this comical priest. Suddenly, the gallop of several more horses could be heard approaching behind. The riders around Dan broke the circle and reformed. Stand back, or face the wrath of the sacred fire. Fergos called out as his men closed ranks on the riders. Dan had still not made his own move. He remained still as Reg and Kyontan came to his side. A quarter mile down the road to the south, Dan could see Reese and Thon approaching. Fergos raised his right hand to the Moscow priest. Take your lies back to your nest of horrors. Oh, a northern priest. You are fortunate to arrive when you did, said the evil priest. This man had just discovered the folly of his ways. Now you men may join him. I don't think so, said Fergos. He abjured the young cultist with a frightful vision he inserted directly into his mind. Behold, your own darkest fears. Uh, uh, uh! The priest screamed out and then turned and ran away. The other horsemen, unsure how powerful these strangers may be, followed the priest in a hasty retreat, taking with them the cart containing the bound man. Before any of the others, particularly Weiss, could chastise Dan's leaving, Fergus offered him reassurance. What have you seen, my son? Only sorrow, Dan replied. That was a line from a proverb that Fergus told of the young warrior who defied his god for his own aims. In the end, despite his many victories, riches, and women, he found only sorrow. The very soil of these lands are beset by evil. No wonder the Orc Horde stays away. Where have you been? Demanded Rhys, who approached angrily with Thon, his young ranger apprentice, beside him. They had tracked Dan to this place, and Rhys wanted to know why that was even necessary. But before Dan could answer, Fergus intervened. I am asking for his report now. Thank you, Master Rhys. Dan has completed his scouting mission. We've learned what we needed to know. We can now return to our base. 
There was nothing else that Reese could say. Fergus was indeed the leader, and seemed to intimate that it was he who had somehow inspired Dan to go. I always found it strange how Fergus, the very light and essence of fidelity and truth, could always find a place for these heavenly glimmers of exaggeration when it came to Dan. Later, when Dan asked why he had covered for him, Fergus told him. Dan, you're a member of the Order now. You're not a prisoner. If you need to take leave, just say so. But you would have convinced me to stay and not to go. And we would not now have our answer. Dan replied. Fergus smiled and nodded. <laughs> that is true. I trust your instincts, Dan. You have blessings most of us will never comprehend. It's just there have been several instances recently where we've completely lost contact with some of our most elite members. Their paths all seem to lead to this area, to the Charmel River Valley. Eleanor, this strange trend has made the Triumvirate very concerned. I certainly don't want to lose you like that. Fergos finished anointing Dan with his protective serums and blessings. Let's get back to our mission. We found another dugout. It's a large one. Dan nodded. The following day, most of the group watched the entrance of a cave from atop of a rocky cliffside, hiding from sight behind a bluff, awaiting a signal. That signal finally came when a slim and unarmed man ran out from the cave's entrance. He held his left hand to his chest to hold in place his shining amulets. The many necklaces and bracelets on his wrists jangled against other conspicuous jewelry pieces. From a distance, he appeared almost to be a running treasure chest. He was quite fleet of foot as he sprinted away from certain death. Behind the man and his jangling jewelry came a rush of angry orcs. They were clearly uncomfortable in the hot noonday sun, but eager to kill the wandering tradesmen whose shiny wares were irresistible to them. The small man leapt over a rock ledge and surfed purposefully down the gravelly slope. The pack of orcs tumbled down after him, snarling. The thin, jewelry-covered man then slipped beneath a large rock jutting out from the ground and then, with a word, disappeared from sight. Several more orcs followed down the slope, all eager to destroy the foolish intruder and claim the shiny jewelry he was adorned with. It was only now, exposed to the harsh glare of daylight, that the orcs learned why this foolish human wandered alone into their cavernous stronghold. Dan was first to strike. With a defensive shield parry, he cleared the two orcs closest to the rock face, which hid the now invisible man. Dan's years of training with the longsword were now brought to bear on the unsuspecting creatures, who squealed in agony with each successive blow. The orcs cried out when they saw they were ambushed, but by then it was too late. Dan was not alone. Theos was close behind and also took the opportunity of surprise to hack down an orc with precision. With him were the ranger lord Rhys and his young apprentice Thon. It was Rhys's plan that led to the speedy disposition of the guards, which opened the way forward to the inner portions of the orc cave fortress. Rhys was the chief military advisor of the mission and a senior member of the order. The remaining orcs fought viciously, but were no match for the experienced ranger and this team of fighting men. He fended off the largest of the orc pursuers with tremendous skill and struck him back onto the rock ledge. There the orc leader fell back and landed on top of something, or someone, unseen. As the orc leader tried to regain himself, two small hands appeared on either side of his large shoulders, and with another quick collection of foreign words, those hands brought fire from their small fingertips and cooked the orc leader to death. The orc wailed in agony, falling back on top of his attacker. 
The small man was now covered in the burning hulk that was the orc leader. After slaughtering the last orc before him, Dan pulled the corpse of the orc leader from the man whose face was now blackened by the smoke of his own attack. Dan smiled at him, amused by the bewildered look of the young mage named Khan. You're just supposed to kill him, not wear him, said Dan. That was not my intention, said Khan in a thick <sighs> eastern accent. It will take three baths to clean this off of me. Such is the life of the bait on the hook, Dan jested, helping him back onto his feet. The jovial scene was cut short as Reese grabbed Dan's arm. What was it about my orders to follow my lead? that you did not understand. He was not at all happy that Dan made the first move. Before Dan could respond, Reese ran off up the gravelly hill to regain military command of the group, which was now in pursuit of the remaining orcs. The last of the orc fighters were fleeing back uphill towards the entrance of the cave. Thon gave Dan a look of disapproval and followed Reese as he led them all forward into the cave. They were joined by Fergus and his two new sword bearers, the paladin knights, Reggie and Kiantan. Reggie was Fergus' cousin and a true do-gooder, a man of the quest in every respect. Kiantan was a giant of a man from the barbaric lands of the north. He stood over six foot five, with the strength of an ogre, but with the quiet patience of a priest. The two knights were a powerful tandem. The group thrust into the cave and continued to spend the next hour clearing the cavernous orc home of all of its inhabitants, including the women and children. The wargs and pups were also slain, and the large food stocks within were all destroyed. Nothing was left alive. Everything was burned. It was here, in places like this, that Dan saw the ferocity of Fergus' wrath towards the evil spawn that he believed was his duty to purge from the world. The quiet man of peace became a fearsome wielder of the hammer when facing these heinous creatures. This made Dan feel better about the intense personal pleasure he found while killing the orcs. This small conquest was the latest of a dozen such encampments that they had discovered and slaughtered. The missions themselves had become routine and the commonality of such gatherings and their fortified presence on these barren hills, just 100 miles west of the Three Kingdoms, was cause for great concern. Lord Rhys, how many of these nasty holes could there be? Asked Theos. We are but a small scouting party. If these tribes were to all unite into one army, I'd imagine there are as many as stars in the sky, Reese said, gazing into the horizon of endless dusty hilltops. They have never been known to organize this way. They seem to have found a purpose now, and a community with the other hominoids. That is very troublesome. We need to find the answer. The more there are, the better, answered Dan defiantly. For our proficiency to destroy them, I mean. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than swatting down those grotesque... <laughs> he was silenced as a large grunt, a deep voice, and the barking of wargs echoed in the canyon. The large wolves were bred for fighting by the orcs and other mountain humanoids. The group sprang into action. One of the wargs had found a fresh orc corpse on the ground. After sniffing at it for a moment, the warg barked towards the group. Behind the warg, a 12-foot-tall mammoth of a man approached, with two others following behind him. Hill giants, whispered Reese. We must be careful. Dan had never seen a giant before. The three hill giants were twice his size, but without any armor. Despite the clear danger they posed, Dan was eager for his first taste of battle with them. 
The giants approached the pile of dead orcs and screamed up into the hillside in a tongue unheard before by any of the men. Look right up. Look right up. There was no response from the orcish camp. <laughs> There were three giants and two large wolves. They had some animals and other goods atop mules and goats attached to crude ropes. Their heavy giant steps pounded the gravelly surface beneath them. As they came closer, following the trail of orc corpses that littered the path towards the cave entrance, their long and deep breaths for air could be heard like wind rustling through trees. The wargs growled and charged ahead, smelling the human intruders. They led the way. Reese motioned for Thon to lead Dan and some of the others away towards the southern pass. The deep concern on his face was clear. None of these men had any experience fighting creatures of this size. This time, Dan was agreeable to follow the Ranger Lord's lead. But Reggie and Kiantan would hear nothing of retreat. They were both determined to lead the charge and defend Fergus. The wargs were first to arrive. Kiantan whipped his sword at the first, dropping it with a squeal. Reggie was able to fend off the gnashing bites of the second with his shield, stabbing at its torso with his sword. As he forced his sword into the wailing beast, a large hand reached over and grabbed Reggie by the head and lifted him up. The pressure of the giant's grip pressed his helmet painfully into his skull. Uh, uh, Reg uh, yelled in pain as he was thrown down into the rocks like a rag doll. The giant then clobbered him with his club for good measure. It was unclear if Reg could survive that kind of pounding. Kiantan bolted at the largest giant his armor and shield thrusting directly forward like the point of a shining spear. The giant simply swatted him to the side. The weight of his body and armor crashed into the rock cliffs with the force of a sledgehammer. Mighty Kiantan did not get up. Within moments, the virtually indestructible wall of armor, the brave and powerful shield men of Fergos, were both vanquished. Without their protection, the giant approached Fergus unabated. The leader of the White Flame stood upright, his hammer aloft, shouting out at the giants in prayer. Reese and Thon then swooped in. Dan and Theos followed closely behind, looking for an opportunity to take their shot. Unlike the direct approach of the gallant paladins, who now lay on the ground, Reese and Thon took a measured approach. Reese feigned at the giant before him, forcing him to commit his strike. Then he parried and spun around behind him, slashing at the back of his knees. The giant groaned in pain and fell to one knee. Then Thon approached from behind and grabbed the giant's ponytail along the back of his head with his shield hand, forcing the base of his shield into the back of the giant's neck. Then, with his leg extended, Thon pushed on the giant's back, forcing the giant to reach back for him and expose his belly, which Reese then slashed. The giant fell in agony as it tried to gather its spilled innards. At that moment, it became clear to Dan that there was a much different approach required for this kind of combat. He retreated into a narrow cave as the massive, angry giant swatted at him wildly with the club that fell Reggie. Just then, Khan sent a volley of magic missiles into the chest of the giant, which offered Dan and Theos an opportunity. The two struck low at the knees and ankles. When it was on the ground, its fearsome reach and strength were no longer a factor. They were now above it and able to stab at it from many angles. They slashed at the giant fiercely until finally it was bled dry by their many piercing cuts. Seeing his two mighty comrades fall, the third giant turned and ran, 
Reese and Thon gave chase and tripped him up. The giant tumbled down the hillside and crashed into the rocky cliffs. He swatted and thrashed in his dire defense, but the ranger lord Reese then finished him off. Reese then lopped off the hill giant's hand as a keepsake, and more importantly, as evidence. Fergos did what he could for his valiant knights. They would survive, but they were both hurt very badly. As a result, the mission was now ended. There was no end in sight to the orc horde that seemed to extend throughout the entire northern borderlands. The small group was low on supplies and needed to brief their masters of the order. The giants themselves, it now seemed, were the ones organizing the orc horde. But to what end? The white flame returned to the castle Voss, the home base of the Order of the Sacred Fire. They marched through miles of open land without roads, many miles away from the coastal cities, away from the threat of the Robinites, thieves, and highwaymen. Fortunately, the rangers directed them away from any further damage. During the trip back, Dan asked many questions of the rangers about the approach to giant killing. He learned about the basic things first. Keeping lower to the ground, never upright. Keeping your hands always below the waist of the giant so they could not be grabbed. And your body compact and never overextended. Likewise, it was advisable to keep the point of your sword close to your helmet while in a defensive posture so your head could not be captured by their huge hands and mighty grips. An unfortunate position experienced by Reg that would be extremely difficult to escape without help. That is why many northern warriors wear horns, as battling the frost giants was always part of their ancient tradition. Thon stressed observing the feet first, then upwards, so as not to focus on their angry faces or upper body. He learned how to keep his feet spread so the giant's instep would always be inside his own outer foot. That way he could parry the shot, extend the shield outward as to not take the brunt of the giant's mighty blow, and then employ the quick spin and pivot moves required to find oneself behind the giant the most opportune place for a human to be. The keys were strike low, pass the attack, never engage a giant head on, and never afford the giant his two greatest assets, strength and size. Pull the sword, never thrust or slash. Find targets of opportunity, wrists, ankles, the back of the knees. These were tactics necessary to encounter and defeat creatures of this size and strength. Dan was a quick study. It was during this time, on the road back to Voss, that Dan's friendship with the young ranger Thon was formed. Dan trusted him, and Thon was a true student in the art of giant killing, something Dan now wanted to know everything possible about. Because it seemed the giants were the apparent inspiration for the orc attacks, Dan found a new place to exact justice. This experience had changed his life, for now Dan's greatest ambition was to follow in the footsteps of his ancestors and the teachings of his god. He wanted to become a master giant killer. <laughs>